Welcome to this Fathom interview. I'm Jack Emma i Deputy Editor of Fathom. With me is my fellow Deputy Editor, Khaled ben Dor, and we're delighted to be joined today by Dr. Michael Milstein. Dr. Milstein is a leading expert on the Palestinian arena. He's the head of the Palestinian Studies Forum at the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies at Tel Aviv University, and a senior fellow at the Institute for Policy and Strategy at Rachman University. He's a former advisor on Palestinian affairs to COGAT, coordinator of government activities in the territories, and headed the Department for Palestinian Affairs and Israeli Military Intelligence. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Several articles have been written about Israel's intelligence failure, explaining how a Hamas plan, walls of Jericho, were already in Israel's possession, that there were warnings about increased Hamas training, including taking over a, a mock Israeli community. How do you explain Israel's intelligence failure in the lead up to October 7th? Uh, well, you know, regarding this uh, question of the failure of October the 7th, I, uh, for uh, more than 100 days, I, I, I argue that we're not speaking only about intelligence failure, but almost about a national failure. Because, you know, when you're asking yourself what went wrong on October the 7th, it was, it was not only uh, some problems regarding the intelligence of uh, not uh, identifying all kind of signals or uh, uh, assessing uh, or, or having uh, wrong assessments about uh, about the uh, the enemy, but it was a lack of understanding which uh, which many many uh, decision makers here in Israel uh, shared about the other about Hamas. You are speaking about political and security decision makers. You are speaking about. Uh, about uh, senior figures of the academia and even senior figures in Israeli media, and of course, from the intelligence. And, uh, you know, on October the 7th, uh, when I'm trying to really to, to get deep and ask, uh, ask ourselves, the Israelis, uh, what was the problem? The problem. So I, I think that the problem is that we didn't understand the Hamas at all. We didn't understand really the basic ideological DNA of Hamas. And this uh, lack of understanding, I think that you can find its roots in lack of, uh, of uh, knowing uh, the language and, the, and really understanding the culture of the other. Uh, you know, in everywhere in Israel, I mean, in, in, this, in the public, uh, among decision makers and all, all, and also among uh, intelligence uh, uh, officer, there are less and less people who really know Arabic, who really uh, uh, know deeply the culture of the uh, of the uh, uh, Middle East, the culture of Islam and, and of the Arab world. And I think that if you don't have really the key for this uh, uh, this uh, uh, dilemma, you cannot really understand uh, the other. For example when we are speaking about Hamas, for several years, you know, maybe a decade, many people in Israel, they uh, they pretended or, or they believed that Hamas is a ruling party. Hamas thinks in the same patterns as us, according Western style patterns. Hamas is focused on, on uh, improving its own uh, society uh, conditions. Hamas uh, is deterred from Israel. And if, I think more and more Israelis could read Arabic, could read the, the newspapers of Hamas, could hear the uh, radio stations and the TV stations of Hamas. They could understand that the basic headlines in, of Hamas was not a deterrence from Israel, was not aspired to uh, increase the number of permits of workers from Gaza to Israel, but jihad. And, uh, you know, uh, this leads me to the other reason for the... Uh, for the uh, failure, and this is much more focused in the intelligence, and we're speaking about rely, relying too much on uh, technological and uh, advanced sources that gave us, the Israeli intelligence, the impression that we really uh, 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 have a full cover of the enemy, of, of Hamas, that we don't need really to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, have the uh, OSINT the uh, open space sources, the the the, uh, the public, uh, the the uh, media, and the other uh, the other regular sources. We don't need even human, you know, human sources 
uh, inside Gaza and we don't need to listen for the tactic uh, communication of Hamas because we do have a very, very uh, unique and advanced, uh, advanced sensors. And we understood after October the 7th that you cannot rely on, uh, on advanced high technology. It is not enough. It is a very good tool, but it doesn't give you really the, the full alarm and the full understanding of the logic of the other side. And I do think that uh, those are the deepest roots of the, of the failure. Michal, I mean, there's so many things I, I want to follow up on that, but we'll, we'll, move, we'll move on to the next topic for now. Um, how do you, you know, we're, we're 100 ish plus days, 100, more than 100 days into uh, kind of the campaign. Days. And um, I, I'm interested how you evaluate kind of how that's going so far. And if you could also just relate to, to like these days in Israel, there's, there's an ongoing debate about you know, there's, there's two main war aims, declared war aims. One was to destroy or to dismantle or, you know, if it's eroding, to yeah. uh, significantly weaken uh, Hamas. And the other was, was was to free the hostages. And, and there, there seemed to be the, these two competing arguments or logics, one of which, pushed by the government, says the way to free is via military pressure. And uh, the second one says, you know, these, these goals ultimately clash. One is long-term and might take years uh, fighting Hamas and the hostages don't we, we don't have that time and, and we need to do a deal as soon as possible so I'm interested in how you feel it's going so far and just to relate to that debate that, that's going on at the moment yeah uh, uh, well I, I think you know first of all Caleb that uh, 111 days after the war uh, uh, began, we in Israel we are much more realistic about the strategic goals of the of the war because you know uh, 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 during the first day of the war, uh, our prime minister announced that the basic the re the, the, the total goal uh, of this campaign is to erase Hamas. And now we do understand that we need to be much more realistic. You cannot really erase a movement of one 100,000 members and much more uh, people who are affiliated with this uh, organization. You can erase the military and the regional and the, uh, sorry, the regime capabilities of Hamas, but you cannot really vanish this uh, organization uh, uh, from Earth. And I think that, you know, th those were the slogans of uh, three months ago, and now we 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 uh, we understand in much a uh, much more uh, 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 in a in a deeper manner uh, what what can be done and what cannot. And you know, I think that when we're checking the strategic balance of Israel, uh, 111 days after the war began. So of course we are speaking about a lot of disadvantages. You know, it is one of the horrible wars Israel had since its, its establishment. The wars. We are still in a trauma. There was, uh, uh, you know, unprecedented invasion into Israeli territory, unprecedented uh, uh, massacre uh, in Israeli citizens, and of course uh, uh, a lot, a lot of uh, other negative uh, phenomena, uh, phenomena uh, like uh, you know, opening uh, several uh, uh, fronts in the same time, and uh, uh, a deep alienation between this public. And the, uh, and the and the leadership in the government but on the other side you can see also some positive uh, developments such as the uh, uh, rapid uh, response of Israel that uh, two weeks after the uh, the surprise actually started uh, to uh, to promote a ground maneuver into Gaza uh, the damage that was caused to Hamas was very severe Hamas still exists but the the damage is unprecedented for Hamas and uh, I think from the internal uh, point of view, uh, the Israeli society demonstrated unprecedented solidarity. You know, we, we are really lucky that our society is much stronger and I think that even much cleverer than the leadership. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, uh, correct, we arrived at a junction, a T-junction. We have two alternatives. I think that, you know, all the ideas of the third stage and we will have a, a very a, a very long uh, campaign and we will buy this uh, long campaign without any uh, borders. 
uh, we will uh, uh, defeat Hamas and in the same time release the hostages. No, no. There are only two options right now and the Israeli public must understand it. We can uh, release the hostages and the meaning of this option, of this alternative, is that first of all, we have to end the war. It's not only a ceasefire, a temporary ceasefire. We have to end the war. We also have to consider uh, withdrawal from Gaza. And for at least for the, the coming months, maybe years, we have to, to accept Hamas as a fact uh, in, in Gaza. On the other hand, there is the option of freely uh, causing uh, Hamas to, uh, to let's call it as a political or military uh, a player, to be vanished. But we must understand in Israel that in order really to erase the military and the, and the regime capabilities of Hamas, you must take control over all Gaza. It's not enough only to get uh, into the northern parts of Gaza, but then to get out of them, because very quickly Hamas returns to, to those places. You cannot only put a siege uh, over Khan Yunis, but then to, uh, to remove it because Hamas is still, is still exists. And, and, you know, without taking uh, control over all Gaza, nothing will happen. The problem is the prices, the international, economic, social and military prices. And I do think that here in Israel, the main discourse should be this T-junction. And uh, I must admit that if Israel will not promote this broad campaign against Hamas, Israel must consider more in a more and more serious manner the issue of the of the deal of the of releasing the hostages. If I could just drill down with you for a moment, you, you talked about option number one is is freeing the hostages, but basically withdrawing from Gaza and agreeing to de facto continued Hamas control. I, I know you, you you didn't mention the I don't know six thousand plus prisoners in Israeli jails including some very, very senior Hamas officials, including, I would say, probably several hundred Nukba fighters who carried out the massacre yeah. on October 7th. Are, are they also, is freeing them also part of that package for, for option one? Yeah, you know, it's amazing, Caleb. Uh, I didn't mention it because, uh, you know, I tried to put a focus on the basic demands of Hamas. And if you check Hamas, uh, Hamas announcements and the, the discourse among Hamas uh, uh, senior figures, they their, their their main focus is on uh, ending the war, stop uh, all the uh, all the attacks, uh, withdrawal from Gaza, and also to renew or to make the uh, humanitarian assistance to Gaza broader. Only in the fourth or the fifth uh, place they, they put the the issue of the prisoners. Of course, it's a very important uh, uh, issue for them, but this was not the reason of of this campaign. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that the Israeli public is quite convinced. And, 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 and I feel, this is my assessment, my personal one, that most of the, the, uh, the public here in Israel, not all of, uh, all of uh, it, but most of it, agree today that uh, there is no other way but to release a lot of uh, prisoners, of, uh, of course, also prisoners uh, with blood on, on their head, heads, hands. Uh, we, we mean, of course, uh, those who uh, were committed for a long years in jail because of uh, their involvement in, in, uh, in uh, murders. Uh, and, um, you know, of course, it's going to be a dramatic uh, disagreement and uh, dispute here in Israel. But I do assess that the, the majority in Israel understand and are ready to pay this uh, price. And uh, of course, it won't be easy. If I, if I could just ask you about um, the, the tunnels, Michael. It, it seems that Israel, despite the intelligence, significantly underestimated the, the breadth and the length, probably, of so many of these Hamas tunnels. I agree. Um, are there kind of effective uh, solutions or, or kind of military policies that can that can destroy these these tunnels? I think you know it, it, it's quite simple. First of all, I, of course, I agree. Uh, you know the intelligence, the mili uh, not only the military intelligence, but also Shin Bet, the Shabak here in Israel, 
knew about the tunnels. They didn't know uh, uh, how sophisticated and broad this whole national project is. You know, it's not only a, a system. It's really a national project. And, uh, you know, there is no easy uh, way to, uh, to uh, solve this problem. The only way is to be with boots on the ground, as, uh, as IDF was in the northern parts of Gaza, to move from one house to another, from one street to another, to find all the, uh, all the uh, 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 places where uh, Hamas, uh, Hamas was digging uh, tunnels and to destroy them. And uh, the same thing that uh, happened in the northern parts of Gaza, uh, IDF is doing right now in Khan Yunis area. And it's, you know, it's obvious that in all the places that IDF didn't enter to, I mean, Rafah area or the central parts of Gaza Strip, uh, mainly the Deir al Balah, we will find the same problem over there. And uh, if we're speaking about a long term campaign, it means that IDF will have to enter those places and will have to find all the tunnels over, over there. And of course, you know, via those tunnels, many Hamas members uh, uh, succeed, uh, 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 succeed to, to move from one place to another. And uh, we, we do understand that we're speaking about whole city uh, that is parallel to the city that is, uh, is uh, 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 on the ground. Uh, we're speaking about under the ground city. A related tactical question. There were reports that as the IDF withdrew from certain parts of northern Gaza that, that Hamas was able to regroup in those in those areas. If Hamas begins to operate as, as small cells rather than as brigades, how can Israel deal with that? Well, first of all, uh, it's correct. Uh, you know, th there is no vacuum in Gaza. Uh, IDF uh, took uh, control over most of the city of Gaza. And after uh, uh, those units of uh, the Israeli units uh, left, left them, so it's obvious that uh, Hamas now uh, is uh, controlling once again on those areas. By the way, it's not a very, um, let's call it a very public uh, control. They, they do understand that IDF can, uh, can uh, attack anyone who will wear uniforms, any, any uh, uh, for example, a car or, uh, or any vehicle. That will be uh, a very uh, that will look a very uh, a very formal vehicle uh, uh, of of Hamas. So they are very cautious, uh, but it's quite uh, it's quite clear that they they have uh, once again. I don't know if it is one hundred percent control, but most of the control over those areas. The main problem, as you mentioned, Jack Homer, is that. Uh, there is a insurgency in some places, you know, a guerrilla fighting uh, in, in many places where uh, IDF, uh, IDF uh, uh, acted and uh, IDF defined it as breaking the basic frames, military frames of Hamas, mainly the battalions of Hamas. So, OK, we don't have any battalion. We, you know, their commanders were killed by IDF, but we have a lot of cells. We have a lot of guerrilla fighters. And today, for example, the main fighting in the northern parts of Gaza is not against uh, uh, broad, uh, broad units uh, of Hamas or, or all kind of uh, more, more uh, 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 sophisticated uh, 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 frames, but against uh, cells. But, you know, as the Americans uh, found out in Iraq after 2003, this problem of the guerrilla, of the insurgency, it's sometimes much more bloody and uh, much more uh, uh, is much more heavy headache than fighting uh, a division or conventional units uh, of uh, of army. Thank you. I mean, another tactical question now about the sort of the importance or not, perhaps as the case may be, of of weapons smuggling. There's been much talk of how without Israel operating in Rafah, specifically along the, the Philadelphia corridor along the border with Egypt, yeah. Israel, Israel won't be able to prevent Hamas from multiple the army. At the same time, the, the proportion of Hamas weaponry which was made locally in Gaza seems to have been underestimated. So what, what's, your, what's your take on that? You know, this is a, a key point, uh, uh, Jack Omer, because 
uh, if your basic uh, goal is really to change dramatically the strategic situation in Gaza, you cannot leave this gate of uh, what we call in Hebrew Philadelphia uh, corridor between Kerem Shalom and the shore of uh, Rafah open because it, it is quite clear that in a, immediately after IDF will leave, will leave uh, uh, Gaza Strip, Hamas will use this uh, this corridor and Rafah border crossing as uh, as the, a source to uh, once again to reconstruct its military capabilities and once again to to uh, to promote uh, uh, military threats uh, against Israel. This uh, this uh, uh, decision that uh, our prime minister announced about it was a month ago that Israel is deter is determined to uh, to uh, create a new situation a new order in uh, the corridor of uh, Philadelphia and including uh, Rafah uh, uh, a border crossing i i want to believe that it's serious enough the main problem or the two main problems here first of all is egypt and you know uh, let's call it uh, like that um, the egyptian role is very uh, complicated because uh, I, I, you know I, I can say it. if the egyptians were serious enough uh, regarding uh, controlling and monitoring uh, the whole uh, area of the border not only ruining the tunnels they they ruined uh, more than 1000 tunnels under the ground in a, in the in the philadelphia corridor but also uh, uh, monitoring what is happening in in the in the rafa uh, border crossing i think that uh, hamas could not uh, become uh, such a dramatic or, or a powerful uh, uh, military uh, military player so they they do have responsibility for the current situation but israel cannot ignore egypt you know we do have a strategic uh, relations with with uh, egypt it is very important for Israel. We cannot, we cannot say, okay, we don't care about their opinion regarding uh, uh, Rafah. We must promote any kind of military move with full coordination with the Egyptians. I do want to believe that if there will be um, a very frank and direct dialogue between our prime minister and the Egyptian prime minister, and we did hear, hear uh, for example, yesterday, that uh, there was there were problems with uh, with the attempt to create or to have a, a, a direct talk between uh, between the two of them. I mean, President Sisi and Netanyahu. I do think that if there will be uh, mutual uh, mutual uh, uh, respect and mutual confidence, I do think that we can uh, we can promote a very effective uh, military move in uh, in this area. And once again. You cannot really speak about a new situation or changing the basic equation in in Gaza without a new a new uh, a new um, a order in this area, the gate of uh, of uh, Gaza to the world. Okay, thank you, Michal. And um, if we can move on to um, if we can move on to the day after, in inverted commas, I think generally when when people talk about this, um, who will rule Gaza? Both militarily and in terms of looking after the civilians there's primarily three main uh options one one is israel one is uh the pa or an upgraded pa uh if you like and the third is some sort of combination of, of pragmatic sunni countries uh you recently wrote a piece in haaretz where you criticized a fourth option that some in the government uh have been talking about this kind of Possibility of forging ties with uh, Hamulas, with clans in Gaza, to fill the to, to fill the vacuum. Um, can you kind of map out these options for us? Um, and, and in your opinion, what what might work, and what um, would the government, the Israeli government, need to do in order to advance that option? Yeah. So uh, you know, the the good news, uh, Caleb, is that Israel started to speak about the day after because uh, for about a month, even month, more than a month, uh, the American administration was much more uh, advanced, much more in his discourse about it than than Israel. The bad news is that you cannot really speak about the day after while you're in the day before. You know, I mean that if Israel will not stay in Gaza, if IDF will not stay in the northern parts of Gaza. 
you cannot really uh, 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 even imagine a new situation in, in those places. If we're speaking, uh, we, if we try to get deep to the, the uh, scenarios of the day after, so as you mentioned, there are between three to four uh, scenarios. There are people in Israel, also in the government, that really wish to implement this scenario of full control and di direct control uh, over Gaza. They even speak about uh, re-establishment of the settlements, you know, Bankville and Smotrich, uh, I think that tomorrow they want to uh, to uh, arrange a demonstration nearby the uh, border between Gaza and Israel and to call for the re-establishment of Gush Katif, you know, the area of the settlements in, in uh, Gaza. I assess that most of the Israelis, even the right-wing supporters, they oppose this uh, uh, idea. We understand that the price in every aspect is too high economically, militarily, politically, international, from the international point of view. The other option, as you mentioned, is the PA. You know, the problem when you speak with PA uh, uh, representatives and uh, when you visit the West Bank is that the PA is very weak. You know, they, they, they barely controls, they control the West Bank. There are places in the West Bank like Jenin area in the northern parts of Samaria they, they do not control it all. And I don't think that we should uh, really uh, believe that uh, in the current situation, they, they control 2.2 uh, uh, million people in a miserable place that really hate them. You know, they were told by Hamas to believe that Abu Mazen is a collaborator with Israel and that Abu Mazen is the one who is really responsible for all their uh, uh, suffer. Uh, there is the option that uh, many people in the government uh, elaborated, the chieftaincy. You know, let's uh, let's uh, create, it, it won't be one address, but several and many addresses in, in Gaza based on clans. The main, the main problem is that most of those clans, uh, you know, they are armed. They can be a militias. It can be like our very bad adventure in Lebanon 40 years ago when we decided that the Falangas of a uh, of, uh, Jumail family, they are our allies. We didn't understand it's a mafia. You know, there are, it's a, <laughs> we, it was a militia and not, 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 uh, not only a, a clan. So this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, experience can be very negative. And the last uh, uh, alternative, which I'm, I must admit is full of question marks. I'm not very uh, uh, confident about it, but I still think it's the least worst scenario is to establish, oh no, to assist the Palestinians to establish a local administration based on local forces, such as mayors, uh, Fatah, uh, Fatah uh, leaders, uh, leaders of the uh, uh, professional associations, that will uh, give us uh, give um, uh, solutions for the uh, uh, civil affairs and the civil problems. I think that uh, this kind of entity should be should have a very close relations with the PA. And uh, you know, you asked about what what uh, what what are the demands from Israel. So this is one of the demands right now. The Israeli government doesn't want to speak about any kind of uh, involvement of the PA in the day after in Gaza. And, you know, I think that we should be uh, mature enough to understand that we, it is not a black and white uh, uh, options. We're speaking about, about uh, the, uh, the need to, uh, to deal also with the PA. Yeah, of course, they're full of problems. They are not the ideal partner but they should be involved in the day after in Gaza, even in, in, a, in, a, in a symbolic uh, manner. And, you know, maybe after a year, two, three years, in a gradual manner, this kind of uh, establishment of administration can be strong enough and stable enough. And maybe they, we, we will also uh, be able to speak with the Palestinians, with, with this address about political uh, aspects, but you know, I, I don't want to be too much naive because let's uh, let's say that right now we should be focused on the civil affairs, and I do think that this kind of of administration, I think it's quite likely that they will give uh, uh, solutions for the for for the civil problems. 
Let's touch on, on a related point to aspects of, of that answer that, that you've given there. When you and I spoke last in, in London about nine months to 12 months ago, that the security arena that most concerned us at that point was the West Bank. It wasn't, it wasn't Gaza. Yeah. What's your assessment of the current terror threat from the West Bank? To what extent is, is it orchestrated by Hamas or local cells? What's the current capability of the of Palestinian security forces? How significant do you think the removal of al aruri was? And, and to what extent is Iran pulling strings in the West Bank? Yeah, you know, uh, I really uh, agree with you, uh, Jack Omer. You know, till October the 7th, the biggest headache from the Israeli point of view regarding the Palestinian arena was not Gaza. Uh, you know, regarding Gaza, most of the Israelis, I mean, the decision makers, thought that, okay, this is a, a relatively quiet uh, arena. The main problem is the West Bank. And, you know, it's quite amazing because 111 days after the uh, war began, I, I, I cannot say that uh, it's a calm uh, arena. It's a calm place. Not at all. But we don't face a third intifada uh, or, you know, uh, a, a direct uh, confrontation with the PA. And, you know, this kind of relatively, relatively calm situation causes uh, Yehye Sinwar in Gaza a lot of disappointment, a disappointment because he really wanted uh, that uh, this arena, the West Bank, and this, the Arab sector here in Israel will be inflamed immediately after the, the offensive of October the 7th. And th th this, thing, this scenario never happened. But I do think that we, we should really be still uh, very, uh, very, um, we should uh, uh, consider what is happening over there uh, in a very serious manner, because first of all, the PA, I think, is getting weaker from day to day. You know, about a month ago, uh, Khalil Shkaki, one of the, uh, the, the prominent, uh, uh, the prominent uh, 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 heads of, of uh, polls or in, uh, po uh, polls and in, in, uh, public opinion uh, organizations, uh, in, in institutes, in the West Bank published a, a poll that showed that about 90% of the Palestinians, they really want Abu Mazen to, to, to leave the, his, uh, his position and to resign. And the alienation and the image uh, of the PA in the eyes of the, the Palestinians is, is very bad. So I think that, you know, there are two challenges or threats right now uh, from the Israeli point of view. First of all, that uh, the uh, PA will gradually die you know, it won't be uh, a, 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 a total collapse in one in one moment. It will be a gradual uh, dying, and you know that's why there is such a, a tough dilemma among Israeli uh, decision makers about the money, about the taxes uh, uh, transfer to the Palestinians. Because from the one hand, you do understand that they are using uh, this money even uh, in order to pay uh, families of terrorists. And uh, of course, they are, once once again, they are not the ideal partner. But on on the other hand, we do understand that without this money, this whole uh, uh, entity will collapse. And the alternatives of the uh, of the the existence of the PA is worst for uh, Israel. We're speaking about a vacuum. We're speaking about maybe uh, a, a a scenario that Israel will have to get into this vacuum and supply the Palestinian population in the West Bank uh, its uh, civil needs. And maybe Hamas will take advantage of this vacuum and can uh, really uh, really be the, the prominent leader. Uh, regarding the uh, question of uh, Saleh Aruri, um, his assassination was a month ago. So I think that, you know, there is no doubt that we're speaking about a very se a, a severe damage uh, uh, to Hamas. This person, this leader of Hamas, was really responsible for, for uh, uh, promoting most of the terror and the incitement in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. He was also responsible for the strong relations with Iran and Hezbollah. Of course, you know, in the Middle East and, uh, of course, in Hamas, uh, if you uh, assassinate uh, such a prominent leader, it causes uh, a damage to the organization, but it doesn't mean that uh, this man has no alternative. Maybe his alternative will have uh, will, will need time to grow and to be stronger 
but uh, it, and maybe it will take several years. But uh, at least for now, it seems that uh, the rate, relatively, the rate of terror and incitement in the West Bank because of uh, his his uh, uh, because of uh, his assassination got uh, more limited than uh, uh, until he was alive. And uh, I think that we maybe Israel should uh, should promote. Uh, Another similar uh, acts like that in order really to uh, preserve the uh, current situation. But as as I said before, in the same time we must also promote economic, even political uh, uh, moves regarding the West Bank. You know, let's let, let's say that economic right now it's enough because the political uh, arena here. I, I don't think that anyone will right now promote any kind of uh, strategic move regarding the PA. So uh, I do think that the, the, this dilemma should be uh, should be uh, uh, discussed in a very uh, serious manner. Michal, if, if I remember, I, I think actually when you were on a, a Bicom podcast with Richard, you, you've written about kind of, I don't know which generation it is, whether it's X, Y, Z, whatever we're yeah. on now, about kind of the, the, the TikTok generation and, and the lone wolf I think just the violence you see in the, in the West Bank and, you know, the idea for going into some of these refugee camps for 24, 48, 70 hours, um, the different kind of militias that are now being formed. Can you kind of describe them a little bit for us, kind of what what motivates them, what what um, formed them in the first place? Yeah, you know, we're speaking about the Gen Z of the Palestinian arena. Uh, young people who were born, most of them were born after the year of 2000. It means that, you know, they were born to a very, uh, very uh, confused uh, hybrid uh, situation. They were born after Oslo Accord uh, was uh, signed into uh, this unclear entity of the PA. But in the same time, they were taught to understand that they are in a long-term uh, conflict, and they should also sacrifice themselves for the uh, for the uh, uh, goals, the national goals of uh, of uh, fighting uh, Israel. You know, before speaking about the young generation in the West Bank, we speak. We must speak also with, also about the Gen Z of the of Gaza Strip, because the massacre of October the seventh was made in a very broad uh, part. By the by the this Gen Z of the of Gaza, you know this Gen Z was educated in the uh, in the education systems of Hamas. He actually was taught by the uh, ideological messages of Hamas. He was also a generation like all the Gen Z in the world who is very much uh, influenced by the uh, by the uh, internet webs by the social media, by the very shallow messages. And when you, when you, uh, you know, I, I would call it analyze the horrible uh, acts of, of uh, October the 7th, of course, it's a result of ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, incitement by Hamas, but also I think that it's a very unique phenomenon of the, uh, of the uh, Gen Z, you know, of really, uh, considering this whole military or, or terror attack as a computer game, you know they they there was a zero uh, uh, zero uh, um, uh, thought about uh, about the Israelis or the Jews as a human beings, and they they really thought in a very technical manner regarding the West Bank. The main uh, phenomenon since. Uh, uh, during the last two years, uh, are is is the uh, the uh, variety or the uh, the uh, uh, the many many uh, uh, infrastructures, uh, military one, local one, who are based on the young generation with who are not affiliated with one of the political organization, not Hamas, not Fatah, not the Islamic Jihad. For example, there was a very prominent one. The lions, uh, uh, the lions. Uh, uh, what was the name in English? Uh, then, then in, in Nablus. Uh, 
in, in a relative manner, they, they still exist, but they are very weak now. And it was very, very interesting to see, first of all, that they're, they, they really hate the PA. They don't want to be a part of Hamas or to have any, any uh, uh, connection with Hamas. And they actually, they pro protest against any kind of authority. You know, in this particular uh, uh, source of, of uh, alienation, we can find the uh, the uh, footnotes of of Iran because Iran is trying Iran and Hezbollah they are trying to to uh, to uh, find all those groups who have uh, who have no uh, or no uh, a, a source of uh, for authority and really to uh, to create uh, you know menu uh, uh, leverages uh, uh, for them supplying them money, supplying them intelligence, supplying them uh, even weapons. We saw it during the last year. Uh, and uh, there were several cases when Shimbet, NIDF intelligence, succeeded to uh, to expose and to prevent those attempts. But I do, I do uh, assess, and I do know, uh, it's not only an assessment, that Tehran is in ongoing attempt to, uh, to inflame the uh, the atmosphere in the West Bank by using those local uh, uh, infrastructures and by using the anger of the Gen Z of the uh, Palestinian arena. Okay, just um, just I guess I was going to say one last question, but actually it's 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 one and a half questions. Uh, you, no you, you wrote you wrote recently about uh, kind of the Palestinian national movement in general. Uh, you said October 7th massacre is another chapter in the more than century old bipolar narrative for the Palestinians, which fluctuates between aggression and victimization. Palestinians are a people steeped in suffering, disappointment, and drubbings, but they are adept at initiating assaults on their enemies, often amid the perpetration of war crimes. Um, can, can you explain what you mean by that? And it's, I guess it's a, a half related question. Um, Salam Fayyad or Fayyadism, which I think yeah. offered a very different approach to Palestinian nation building, state building, etc. Uh, right. I'd love you also just to say a, a few words about either him as a, an individual or, or Fayyadism as a as a concept. Sure, uh, you know, uh, Caleb, when we're speaking about the ebb uh, that uh, that uh, the uh, the Palestinian national movement uh, faces uh, today. First of all, you know, there, there is a positive uh, point. Uh, I do think, and you know, Khaled Mashal, for example, even, uh, even um, uh, uh, emphasized it as a, as a positive uh, achievement from, this, from the current war, is that after many decades that the, the Palestinians were abandoned and all, almost neglected by the world and were considered as a, as a headache more than a problem, they showed the whole world in the Middle East that you cannot really uh, ignore them, that they can really cause a region, a, a, a regional uh, crisis. They can even cause international crisis. We can see it from the Red Sea to London. Uh, this is the impact of the Palestinian arena. But on the other hand, you know, when you analyze what is happening among the Palestinians and how do they analyze the current uh, the current war first of all you know it's quite amazing there is no one one vision no one strategy nothing uh, but uh, but really enthusiasm because of the offensive of october the 7th you know you're checking for example you speak with i speak with palestinians and i asking them what well, okay you cause the israelis one of the most painful traumas in their histories you know, you you showed that IDF was weak in the first day of uh, of the uh, of the war. What 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 will be after that? What what do you think that will happen? Uh, any kind of reconciliation between the two peoples? Any kind of uh, soul searching? And you know, it's quite amazing because most of the Palestinians they do not speak about you know the long term future about uh, all kind of more realistic. Uh, realistic uh, uh, targets. They speak only about we are victims and we are suffering because of you in the in the uh, refugee camps in South uh, Gaza. 
or we are, you know, victorious uh, uh, players that uh, committed the October October the seventh, and of course they they want to emphasize mainly the um, the military uh, aspect of the uh, of this offensive and less the uh, war crimes that were committed during uh, this day, and you know. I I am really I'm checking every day the Palestinian discourse about the war and about the future, and you can actually find only two uh, two patterns or two kind of uh, response. The uh, the uh, uh, you know the um, uh, describing the, the the whole war as a source of uh, of national uh, uh, pride, or once again we are victims. And uh, I think that you spoke about Salam Fayyad. Salam, Salam Fayyad, I think that he's one of the really the, uh, you know, the strategic uh, options or the strategic uh, uh, hopes, not only of the Palestinians, but also for the Israelis. Because in the period he was a prime minister, between 2007 to 2012, he really spoke about realistic national goals of building a nation state bottom up, building social infrastructure, infrastructure uh, promoting our, our young generation, creating a, a public space and modern uh, political system. Unfortunately, you know, I, I really respect the man, I really respect his vision, but it seems that right now, right now, at least right now, his vision, um, there are not there are no many Palestinians who support the this vision. So you know, I think that right now the question is not what would the Palestinians will do, but what the Israelis will do. Because you know, Caleb, I do think that after October the seventh, the Israeli uh, the Israeli uh, public uh, concluded the two um, two uh, uh, insights. The first is that we, the Palestinians, we cannot live in one entity. Although there are many, many people in Israel, mainly from the right wing, that believe that no problem, we can live with, uh, we call it Medina Achat, one state between the river and the sea, and we will sit under the olive trees and everything will be okay. No, it's going to be exactly like the Balkan. The other uh, conclusion, which stands in a contradiction to the first one, is that uh, you cannot really give the Palestinians, you know, full independence because they they will use the freedom, the full freedom, for example, in Gaza since 2005, in order to promote ex existential threats against you. So I think that the uh, goal of the Israeli of the Zionist project is to, first of all, draw borders physical borders between us and the Palestinians. In Gaza, it's relatively uh, simple, although we do need to uh, also to draw the, the border in the Philadelphia area. In the West Bank, it will be much more, more uh, problematic because of the, uh, the issue of the settlements. But I think that, first of all, we should, uh, uh, you know, implement those historic decisions regarding buffers between us and them. But second, and very important, to keep the gates of Palestine or the Palestinian entity to the world controlled by us, by the Israelis. I mean, the Jordan Valley and the border between Sinai and, uh, and Gaza. Of course, the Palestinians won't, success, uh, won't, uh, won't agree and there will be a protest. But once again, you cannot really achieve uh, uh, the best alter ideal alternative. We need to find a way to separate our ourselves, but to keep that there will be no existential threat on us. And I do think that this kind of strategic scenario can give an answer to the uh, to the Israeli Zionist dilemma. Well, thank you very much indeed. We'll, we'll leave it there. So much for, for our readers, uh, viewers today to, to consider. And uh, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you for having me.